This is Cable Bay on the Anglesey coast. It provides a good example of an exposed rocky shore. Just now it's low tide and the kelps, seaweeds such as the oarweed, Laminaria digitata, are partially exposed. They'll be covered at high tide. Even on relatively calm days such as this, there's considerable wave action. The exposure of a shore such as this has considerable effects on the animals which live on the bare rocks. We can see some of them in this rock pool. Two limpets covered in barnacles. A cluster of mussels. A sea anemone. Various seaweeds. But we're interested in this animal, the dog whelk, Nucella lapillus. When the tide's out, there are many dog whelks to be found on the rocks. They feed on the barnacles which coat much of the rock surface. Where there's an empty crater amongst the barnacles, a dog whelk is almost certainly responsible. In sheltered crevices, there are often the dog whelk's yellow egg cases, firmly attached to the rock by strong threads. There's a cluster of them here. They're difficult to pluck off. Each case contains many tiny eggs. We're going to investigate ways in which dog whelks are adapted to life on two different kinds of shore. First, on this exposed shore, half meter square quadrats are thrown down at random and all the dog whelks within each quadrat are collected. The quadrats must be placed randomly and many specimens are needed for a proper investigation. They'll be taken back to the laboratory for examination. This gives us dog whelk specimens from a very exposed rocky shore. We're also going to collect the animals from a completely contrasting situation. The very sheltered shore of the Menai Straits, just beside the Menai Suspension Bridge. Conditions here are very different from those at Cable Bay. Once again, this is low tide, and you can see the fronds of Laminaria digitata. They're only exposed at low tide, remember. Again, we collect dog whelks from the area. There aren't as many as we found at Cable Bay, but they're here. There are some on the masonry of the bridge supports. They're collected, as before, to take back to the laboratory. As at Cable Bay, they're feeding on barnacles. There's a crust of barnacles coating the lower part of the stonework. If a dog whelk is picked off, you can see the operculum closing, a horny little plate which seals the soft body safe inside its shell. This one's feeding on a barnacle. If we pull at the shell, there's the mollusk's foot, very firmly attached to the barnacle. And that's what happened to the barnacle. We also find periwinkles, another kind of mollusk, browsing on the seaweeds. Periwinkles slightly resemble dog whelks, but there's a sure way of telling them apart. Dog whelks have this groove in the lip of the shell. It's where the siphon emerges when the animal's active. The periwinkle has a rounded opening to the shell with no groove. They're quite different animals. The dog whelks are carnivore, while the periwinkles herbivorous. There are dog whelks under many of the large stones as well. They're collected.
under this rock, there are dog whelk egg cases again. They're empty. The young dog whelks have hatched and emerged through the openings. Stones should always be put back as they were, so that the shores disturbed as little as possible. On a sheltered shore like this, we find a quite different animal in abundance. The shore crab, Carcinus minas. We collect some shore crabs too. They'll be needed for certain laboratory experiments, as you'll see. We've now collected specimens from this sheltered shore and from Cable Bay. Back in the laboratory, we shall examine our samples and see if they tell us anything about the way dog whelks are adapted to life in such different situations. These dog whelks came from one half-meter quadrat on the rocks of Cable Bay, the exposed shore. There's a range of sizes, as you can see. These came from a half-meter square on the sheltered shore at Menai Bridge. There are fewer, and they're all fairly large specimens. There's a difference in shell shape between dog whelks from the two locations. The one on the right from the sheltered shore has a taller, more pointed shell than the one on the left from the exposed shore. Another pair, on the right from the sheltered shore, on the left from the exposed shore. Squatter again without such a point to the shell. Another pair, sheltered shore right, exposed shore left. Accurate measurements are made of all the specimens from both shores. The height of each shell is recorded. It's width. And the size of the aperture, the shell opening. From many such measurements, we can find out if shell shape is related to the type of shore and try to work out why. We also need to know the foot area for each dog whelk. We put the specimens in tanks of seawater and wait until they're clinging to the side. Each specimen is numbered and the shape of its foot is traced. The plastic sheet with the tracings is removed and the area of foot is determined and written down for each dog whelk. Next, we need to know how tightly each dog whelk can cling to a surface. We cement a piece of string to the shell and use a spring balance to measure the force necessary to pull the dog whelk off the glass. Here goes. This one comes from the exposed shore. This is done with many specimens. We might expect dog whelks from an exposed shore to have wider apertures, perhaps, so that they can cling on more tightly than those from a sheltered shore. These came from the Menai Straits. We collect certain other data. The specimens, numbered, are dried and weighed. Then they're boiled in caustic potash solution to dissolve out all the soft flesh from inside the shells. Then each empty shell is weighed so that we can calculate the weight of body tissue for each.
To find out the internal shell volumes, the empty shells are aspirated so that all the air in them is removed and replaced by water. The flask is connected to a suction pump. Now each shell is carefully removed without spilling the water inside it. And it's weighed full of water. We can calculate the weight of the water in each shell and hence its volume. Data on dog whelks from both shores obtained by these methods is given in the experiment booklet. Afterwards, you should work on this data as suggested in the booklet. Now for some experiments of a different kind. There's another factor which might affect the dog whelks on sheltered as opposed to exposed shores. The presence of shore crabs. Some shore crabs are being kept in tanks through which seawater is circulating. They've not been fed for a day or so. Now, shore crabs feed on many shore animals, including dog whelks. Have the dog whelks, which survive on a crab-infested shore, any adaptation which protects them against these predators? Let's watch how a crab deals with such prey. These are dog whelks of various sizes from the exposed shore. Watch. The crab uses its claws to dig the soft, fleshy body of the whelk out of its shell and eat it. You can see how it breaks up the edge of the shell. If we use numbered, measured dog whelks, we can examine the shell fragments left and the dog whelks which survive and discover if there are any particular sizes and shapes of dog whelks which the crabs find it easiest to deal with. Here are some dog whelks with shells of different thicknesses. And the two at the top have thick toothed lips to the shell. Does the thickness of the shell help decide whether the whelk will fall victim to a crab or not? Experiments can be carried out to test this idea. The shore crab examines each dog whelk and definitely rejects certain individuals. They must be too difficult to deal with. Watch this one. No go. The results of experiments like this, using numbered measured dog whelks, suggest that the presence or absence of predatory crabs is important in determining what sizes and shapes of dog whelks are best adapted for life on a particular shore. The experiment booklet provides a great deal of data obtained from measurements made as shown in this film. It also gives some results obtained from crab predation experiments. There are notes suggesting how the data should be processed and presented. If you follow these suggestions, you will be able to elucidate some of the factors which govern the adaptation of the dog whelk, Nucella lapinus, to life on sheltered shores and to life in a more exposed environment.